Hey there, my name is Nick or Robo. Some of you may know me from school or the RTC. If that is the case, you should probably leave, as you most likely won't understand what I'm going to be talking about. Some of you may know me from that mess of that Tales of the Hunger Games Discord server, or Tales of the Hunger Games news on Twitter. If that is the case, welcome. I'm continuing Christian's series past the 100th games. Before I begin, I want to apologize for my crappy microphone, as it is not very good. I would also like to thank Andrew McLean for allowing me to use his wonderful art, and for creating all the renders in this video. Furthermore, I want to thank Christian for creating the series in the first place. I also want to say that this series is unofficial. The official Tales of the Hunger Games continuation is being created by Lauren McCouch, and a link to her fabulous channel can be found in the description. I also want to thank all my friends that have reached out to me even after the end of the Tales of the Hunger Games server. For this, you have earned a place as tribute in the games, just a name. I know I may be saying I would also like to thank way too often, but I want to give a huge shout out to Ken Siapko for helping me proofread the games. I am sorry if you have trouble hearing me again. As for my upload schedule, it is not fixed, but announcements may be found on my Twitter at Tales of the Hunger Games News, T-O-T-H-G underscore news. There's a link to that in the description. Furthermore, if you are confused about names in this series, multiple capital characters are named after influential Tales of the Hunger Games people. Any other important links or info that I might need to say may be found in the description or on Twitter. Lastly, I'm sorry if there is any poor grammar or spelling mistakes in the video. I try my best to prove free with Ken. Now without further ado, let's go. Yeah, I promise I won't make announcements this long in the future. Many years ago, an anonymous scholar by the name of White was believed to have documented all tales of the Hunger Games and the Hunger Games starting from the first. White seemed, however, White seemed to have mistaken many details. Firstly, White claimed that there were many misplaced records in regards to the lives of multiple victors after the games. However, new records discovered by our latest group of scholars claim that there was in fact clear documentation of victors and mentoring and many events that happened after the 100th games. Secondly, White claimed that District 12 was taken over by rebels. Rebel activity was in fact present in District 12 during White's time era. However, newly discovered records indicate that five years after White's death, the capital, bravely led by President Major Cardu, reclaimed District 12 from the rebels. Our newly discovered records show that Cardu and his few commanders spent months plotting a justified reclaiming of District 12. This reclamation was small but successful, and thus greatly impacted the lives of the capital. Furthermore, European nations attempted to attack District 12 again. However, President Cardew's many years of planning paid off, after the capital revealed a brand new high-tech artillery of weapons. This artillery immediately caused the rebellious European nations to sign a treaty that stated both nations would leave each other alone, and that there was to be no war between. President Cardew also reinitiated the Hunger Games, and although there was much uprising in the districts, President Cardew stated that for the rebellious activities of the people of the districts during the 100th games, the games would be resurrected. Despite larger amounts of uprising in the districts, President Cardew wisely worked with his commanders that there was to be a deal signed with the districts. President Cardew bravely ordered that in return for the games being held again, the districts would each receive a 10% increase in food and access to better medical care. In return, the capital would receive its share of the district's good, the Hunger Games would continue, 
and the capital would regain its maximum control over the districts. The radical activity in the districts immediately stopped after this announcement. At first, the district seemed to appreciate the value of the deal. However, certain radical activities soon forced the capital to raise the 10% increase to 15%, and then add access to clean water at all times to the deal. Eventually, the deal was signed, and because of the kindness of the capital, life in the districts was known to have drastically improved. However, the Hunger Games were also reinstated. President Cardew had also ordered that the idea of having quinquennial quells would remain, with twists decided by himself or by his council. After a few days, the decision many district citizens continued to rebel against the capital, whilst claiming that they had still not received enough. These selfish citizens were immediately suppressed by peacekeepers and order was restored to Pan Am within two days. President Cardew also ordered for training centers in districts 1 and 2 to be reopened, and that tributes would receive the training they needed to make the games enjoyable again. As for White, he is be believed to have been mistaken, and to have documented the records at an old age with amnesia. Despite this, White's contributions to our library have been an important part of our current knowledge. Without White's documentation, we would not know much about the history of our fine nation. And for this, a beautiful white statue was erected in Snow Square. The capital is known to have somehow calmed down after the 100th Games after propaganda was spread by President Cardew to keep calm and inform the citizens of the capital. Our newly discovered records show that two years after the 100th Games, President Cardew had completed organizing all details about the continuation of the Hunger Games. He had rebuilt the training center, along with Dalton Studios and Snow Station being refurbished. President Cardew then assigned the role of head of training to a young man named Ken Siabko, who was a key player in helping President Cardew reinstate the Games and worked as a commander to the president. For head of interviews and commentator, he had assigned this young role to a young woman named Lauren Rose. Lauren served a vital role in keeping communications within the capital alive during the pandemic of 112, 112 and helped President Cardew reinstate order after the 100th Games by calmly spreading messages that the capital would not hurt its own citizens. As for the prestigious role of head game maker, Cardew appointed a man named Christian Blanco, who was an award-winning author and helped produce multiple episodes of The Bunger Games and Tribute Spotlight. Christian was chosen for this role as he was commended by Cardew for his ideas and creativity. After many days, the long-awaited 101st Hunger Games reaping took place, starting in District 12 and ending in District 1. Although there was some confusion about District 14, President Cardew reassured citizens that the district would not be returning to Panem. Trinica MacDonald, victor of the 100th Games, arrived in District 12 to begin the reaping. Trinica seemed clearly phased and shocked at what was happening, but somehow kept her composure as she was escorted for a brief tour of the districts and into the town hall. Once the youths were in their enclosures, Tridica was welcomed onto the stage, despite much, much booing and radical activity. Multiple three-finger salutes were performed as well, which caused peacekeepers present to interfere and unfortunately subdue multiple youths. Tridica began by choosing, choosing 16-year-old Nursi Dunold, after which she chose 17-year-old Pika Anonymous. After the tributes were escorted onto the train, Tridica was taken to the other districts to perform the respective reapings. Lauren and Ken covered the reapings and spoke about the tributes as the first day passed by. At District 10's reaping, Megan Davina did not seem disappointed that she had been reaped, but in fact celebrated while telling her peers that she was going to slaughter some children. For District 9's reaping, 
Rymel Handyman and Sassia Sachiko were revealed to be good friends. The day ended off with District 7's reaping, where Connor Brown and Naomi Woodard were chosen. When Naomi's name was called, she whimpered slightly while walking to the stage. When Connor was reaped, Ken complimented his muscular structure, while stating that he definitely stood a good chance at winning. The following day, the remaining reapings were held. In District 6, both youths seemed under the influence, while most of District 5's population struggled with hearing Tritica. In District 4, Tritica selected Typhoon Cult Pest, who seemed very anxious as he went to stand beside his district partner Octopel on the stage. Many Capital viewers seemed very bored until District 2's Reaping Games, which saw Loki Hook and Wifi Malama battle their way to earn the role of tribute, while District 1's talent demonstrations and debates were equally well received. With Lystar Yelena Desai and Zashio Throne each performing well for their respective age groups and earning the role of tribute. Once all tributes were safely within the carriages and transported to the capital, President Cardu announced that chariot parades would return once again and the parades would feature stylists again. Cheers rang out through Snow Square as a limousine carrying the capital's top stylists drove towards the Tribute Accommodation Center. As the tributes were dressed and prepared for the parade, many rumors flew around the capital about what the most popular stylists would dress the tributes in. The following night, the long-awaited tribute parade was held. The parade began with Zashio and Lystar, both from one, leading in elegant diamond gowns and suits. Following them was the District 2 carriage which featured Loki and Weefy in majestic king outfits. District 3's carriage featured a more plain but bright display of electrical lights, while District 4's carriage was very positively received due to the stunning display of glowing shells. After the bland and less appreciated chariots of Districts 5 and 6, Connor and Naomi were presented each with leaves around their hair and ivy around their bodies. Furthermore, their arms were painted brown and decorated with a wooden texture, which received much praise from the capital. Andrew McLean, newly elected lead editor of Andrew Anderson Fashion, and Woof Anderson, principal of the Price School of Design, had joined Lauren and Ken in their announcer's box and commented on how well these outfits had been made. Behind the sevens, Octavian, uh, from eight, waved to the capital, although on a further replay, it was shown that she was crying whilst doing so. The carriage for District 9, which featured Rymel and Sassia, was done in a rather plain manner, as their stylists had been newly graduated students from the School of Design. This saw the two tributes being dressed in rather dull yellow dresses, which was met with boos from Capitol viewers. Megan and Toasted, both of ten, were dressed in bovine-related outfits, along with some fake blood splattered on their bodies to represent butchery. However, many Capitol viewers seemed disgusted by the realistic blood. Behind them, the District 11 chariot was well received, as it saw some of what Woof described as the best plant-based outfits in years. Ending the parade was Pika and Nursey, both of 12, who were dressed in nurse and medic-themed outfits, each armed with a syringe and a scalpel on their sides. However, the chair from District 7 was eventually voted to win the best-dressed title. That night, small uprisings were started within the districts. However, this was quickly suppressed by the large forces of peacekeepers. The following day, training began. The 27, 24 tributes sorry, were greeted politely by Ken, who explained the new rules of training before leaving the tributes to their own devices. Immediately, Zashu and Lystar, both one, headed towards the knife station. However, Zashu did not seem to talk with Lystar much during the practice, 
and after a bit, Loki and Weefy, both up too, joined and asked about an alliance. Lystar immediately accepted, saying that they worked better together. However, Zashio ignored the others and continued to practice. This seemed to ignore Loki, and so Loki grabbed some knives and practiced along that, alongside Zashio, which did not seem to bother him. However, when Loki started aiming at Zashio's targets, Zashio asked Loki to move away, but to no avail. Soon, training staff had to come to separate the boys, while the girls prepared to fence in the fencing station. Once Weefy and Lystar had been dressed appropriately, the fencing match began. At first, Lystar gained the upper hand, earning multiple points by poking Weefy in various parts of the chest. However, Weefy eventually managed to dodge Lystar's attacks and scored multiple times by extending her arm. As the battle ended, Lystar managed to compete, keep consistent throughout, which thus saw her winning the match with a score of 13 to 9. Typhoon, a four, had immediately headed to the aquatic station, where he swam around in the pool aimlessly. After half an hour of this, Limerick Manx, victor of the 88th Hunger Games, yelled at Typhoon to use a weapon. Typhoon obliged, but Ken soon noticed that Typhoon was beginning to whimper in the trident station, and so Ken asked the trainer to help instruct Typhoon on how to use a trident. As the morning progressed, Typhoon's aim soon improved, but was still rather faulty, which saw Typhoon's trainer giving up and telling him to spend the rest of the day swimming and spearing fish instead. Naomi and Connor, both of seven, had spent most of the morning in the axe station, where they spent their time watching the careers. After an hour into trading, Loki approached and threw axes alongside them. At first, Connor and Naomi ignored him. However, Loki eventually grunted louder and louder upon hitting his targets, which saw him grinning happily when Connor and Naomi decided to move to the survival station. Megan, of 10, had spent the morning in the survival station, while occasionally looking towards the knives station. Megan spent the morning improving her knowledge of plants, which was rare from a tribute for, from District 10. Once Weefy and Lastar had moved to the archery station, Megan ran over to the knives station, where she brutally snapped some dummies while, aimlessly su while aiming surprisingly well with knives. This saw her earn impressive looks from the careers. After working in the knives station for half an hour, Megan looked towards Typhoon floating in the pool, and asked Typhoon to hop out of the pool. Upon hearing Megan, Typhoon submerged in shock, but once he resurfaced, the two headed towards Connor and Naomi in the survival station, where Megan said they could form a good alliance due to Typhoon's knowledge of fish and the other's abilities with weapons. Although Naomi had some questions at first, Connor happily accepted the alliance, and the quartet decided to work together for the games. As for Pika of 12, he spent most of his time in the medical station, where he met Sassia and Rymel, both of nine, with whom he shared his knowledge. Soon, the trio formed a strong bond and they agreed to work together. Pika then led the group to the obstacle course, where they completed it whilst cheering each other on, earning cringing looks from the careers. The following morning, the tribute's training scores were assessed. First off was Zashio, who earned a score of 10 after a very respectable display of weaponry. Following him was Lystar, who earned a score of 9 after allegedly using various weapons at different targets in a creative manner. After the tributes from one scores were assessed, Loki scored a high 10 after displaying impressive strength in a short amount of time. All this, although this was not confirmed, a drunk game maker was heard to have leaked this information. It is unknown what Weefy did, 
but she scored only an 8, which was surprisingly low for her career. The other tributes' assessments went by relatively blindly, with Tyspoon scoring only a 5. Connor and Naomi both scored respectable 7s, which saw them scoring on the higher end of the scale, while Rymel and Sassia scored 6 and 5, respectively, which was rumored to have been due to the ability to make traps. After Toasted of 10, Megan scored a high 9, which was most likely due to her vicious temper and skills with weapons. Lastly, Pika ended the male demonstrations with a decent score of 6, which saw him scoring in the middle of tributes. No details of Pika's demonstration were leaked, which led to plenty of rumors spreading around the capital. The very next day, Lauren welcomed the full audience to the interviews. First to be interviewed was Lostar, who calmly greeted the audience and shook Lauren's hand. Lostar began by joking around with Lauren and told viewers that she was good with alliances and knives. Lostar also told Lauren that she would not ally with her district partner, which triggered shock throughout the audience. Furthermore, Lostar ended her interview by stating that she loved the capital energy and that she was grateful they were cheering for her, which triggered massive cheers. For Zashio's interview, he was dressed in a scarlet suit and tie. Zashio politely spoke with Lauren about what he expected in the upcoming games, all while keeping calm and keeping a cool attitude. After Zashio, Weefy spoke calmly for a tribute from District 2, whilst joking with the crowd. When Lauren asked what she would do with her earnings if she won, Weefy thought for a moment, and replied that she would like to marry and have a quiet life. Once Loki was seated on the palm chair, he immediately became a capital favorite, due to his enjoyable banter and sense of humor. When asked what he thought of the other tributes, he stated that they were all pathetic compared to himself. After the relatively uninteresting interviews of the tributes from District 3 and Octopella 4, Typhoon walked onto the stage. Typhoon's interview was a disaster, as it mostly featured him talking about his experience in the fishing industry, which clearly bored capital citizens. As the interview came to a close, Typhoon lost his voice, which made Lauren call off the interview early. Following Typhoon were the interviews of the tributes from 5 and 6, which also preceded Naomi's interview. Naomi walked onto the stage in a lush green ivy dress, which was received positively by the capital. Lauren began by complimenting, complimenting Naomi's outfit during the chair parade, to which Naomi smiled and stated that she had enjoyed wearing it. Naomi then kept calm while telling viewers that she hoped she could make the most out of the game, and that she was disappointed with her reaping. She had to admit that the past was in the past. This triggered rapturous applause, applause from the audience as she walked off the stage. When Connor walked onto the stage in a traditional lumberjack jacket adorned with ivy, many audience members applauded and well whistled, while Lauren commended his outfit for the parade. Connor then smiled and spent most of his interview answering Lauren's questions normally, whilst occasionally pausing to think. Connor ended his interview by politely bowing to the audience and thanking Lauren for her time. <laughs> Following Sassia and Rymel's interviews, Megan walked onto the stage in an outfit made of wool. Lauren welcomed Megan before asking what she was looking forward to in the games. Megan stated that she looked forward to killing as many tributes as possible, which earned her cheers from the audience. Finishing off the night's tributes interviews was that of Pika, who seemed shy at first, but was eventually coaxed out of his shell by Lauren. Pika spoke mostly about his work back home in District 2, and about the time where District 12 was controlled by European nations. 
Many Capitol viewers present were allegedly horrified by the conditions Pika described to have been put forward by the European nations. After Pika had left the stage, game maker Blanca was welcomed amidst a standing ovation. Game maker Blanco answered Lauren's questions while keeping quiet about the arena and plans. Game maker Blanco did tell viewers many times that he planned on making this year's making his first year as game maker a memorable one, which triggered curious sounds and rumors within the audience. After the interview night, more uprisings were started within the districts with many unruly citizens shouting that they had been manipulated by the capital, and that the capital had not increased their food supply whatsoever. However, the peacekeepers within the districts managed to keep order and the games continued without any other major radical activity within the districts. The capital kept calm during this time, as most of its citizens did not know about the uprisings within the districts at this time. The following day, the tributes were taken to the launch rooms under the arena, and after brief goodbyes from their mentors or stylists, the podiums rose into the cornucopia area. As the podiums rose into the arena, many tributes were still clearly shaken by the fact that what they were experiencing was real. However, when the countdown began, they accustomed their eyes to their surroundings and began preparing for the gong. The cornucopia lay in the center of a large destroyed field, which was half covered in grass. <coughs> Excuse me. On the field, Lots of debris was scattered due to the many disasters this arena had endured. The arena itself was described by v to viewers by Lauren to be very old. Lauren told viewers that this arena was once used by Native Americans to play a game called football. Much of the field that was not covered in grass was covered in concrete while many rows of seats lay surrounding the field and concrete. These seats were also covered in much debris. However, most of the seats, especially those near the perimeter of the arena, were free to sit in. The roof of the arena opened to the sky, which meant that any natural weather that occurred would affect the tributes not under cover. The center field was also surrounded by four doors, each in four different directions. The north, west, and southern doors all led to the stands. However, the eastern door led to a hall, which contained many irregularly shaped balls and helmets contained in glass exhibits. Excited cheers in Snow Square rang out as the cameras refocused on the tributes. In the center of the cornucopia, they lay a large amount of weapons. However, there were no other supplies present. Thus, many viewers in Snow Square pointed out that tributes would likely need to hunt for food. The weapons in the cornucopia included knives, axes, spears, tridents, bows and arrows, and swords. Loki of Two looked along the line of podiums and briefly made eye contact with Weefy of Two and Lystar of One. The trio nodded at the weapons in the center while nodding towards other tributes. Typhoon, a four, looked very nervous, and as he eyed the supplies in the center, he seemed shaken with fear when Loki and I Lystar made eye contact. Typhoon looked for Connor and Naomi, both of seven, and Megan of ten, before nodding towards the supplies in the center, then to the other seats. The quartet nodded at each other and looked towards the supplies for the rest of the countdown. Sassia of 9, Rhymewell of 9, and Pika of 12 were placed on adjacent podiums. Thus, the three looked at each other and indicated the sp supplies in the cornucopia. The gong proceeded to ring out and most tributes ran inwards, with only Typhoon, Nursi of 12, 
and Octopella for running away. Upon hearing the gong, Megan immediately ran inwards with surprising speed and picked up a set of knives before licking her lips and stabbing the girl from Eleven in the heart. As the girl fell, Megan spat at the girl before removing her knife and looking for more targets. Loki, Lystar, and Weefy had also run forward, and the three of them had grabbed spears before any other tributes could reach the cornucopia. As chaos began to erupt around them, Lystar impaled the boy from eight in the head as he tried to reach a store. Loki then proceeded to throw a spear a cane of three, missing by mere inches. Loki swore in frustration as he witnessed Lama stabbing the girl from three in the chest. Naomi and Connor had both run inwards when the gong rang, and aimed for axes, but they nearly dodged a knife thrown by Zashio of one. Naomi and Connor grabbed their axes and used a, the blade to deflect a stray knife that had flown through the air towards them. The pair then yelled at Megan to follow, and the trio headed to the southern stands while looking around for Typhoon. When the gong had rang out, Sassia and Rimmel had both run for knives. However, Rimmel was quickly shot in the head with an arrow fired by Turbo, while Sassia was impaled by a spear thrown by Loki. Meanwhile, Pika looked around in panic upon seeing his allies dying, but he regained his composure and grabbed a sword. After grabbing the sword, he narrowly dodged an arrow shot by Turbo and began to run. However, after about two seconds, Pika gasped in shock when he saw Zashio throwing a knife into Lotus of Eleven's head and Stella of Five getting impaled by a spear thrown by Weefy. Pika then looked ready to faint, but came back to his senses upon stepping in some unidentified blood. Pika then sprinted towards the western area before dashing through a door and up into the stands. <coughs> Back in the cornucopia, Loki, Lystar, and Weefy had desperately tried to kill Zashio during the bloodbath. However, Zashio managed to dodge their attacks with surprising agility, and thus he left the cornucopia with two sets of knives. This clearly annoyed Loki, and thus he threw a spear at the cornucopia wall in anger. After about five minutes of Weefy and Lystar calming him down, the trio agreed to look for some food first. Lystar pointed out that she had seen tributes heading into the northern sector, and that they should start their search there. Loki replied that he wanted to kill Zashio first, but Weefy advised against this, as he would most likely be expecting them, and that Zashio could also kill off multiple tr other tributes for them. The trio proceeded to enter the northern doors in search of tributes. Meanwhile, Typhoon, Connor, Naomi, and Megan had headed through the southern doors and up into the stands, where they ascended. Fortunately for them, they were not spotted by the couriers, and thus were able to creep near the top unnoticed. Once at the top of the stands, Typhoon whimpered, but Megan told him to shut up and called him useless for not grabbing anything from the cornucopia. This caused Connor and Naomi to tell Megan off, and as it looked like a fight was about to occur, Megan apologized and the group theorized about where food may be located. After about five minutes, however, Megan pointed out that the careers, who were leaving the cornucopia, and as Naomi asked if the careers would know where food would, could be, seven cannons sounded. 